From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. It's deja vu all over again. Like 2014 Democratic nominee Gina Raimondo and Republican challenger Alan Fong are facing off in the race for governor. But this year, it's Joe Trillo and other independent candidates playing the role of the late Bob Healy what the primary results tell us about the November elections. Joining us on the first half of Newsmakers, Republican National Committee woman for Rhode Island, Leanne Senek, and Executive Director of the Rhode Island Democratic Party, Kevin Olasanoye. Welcome to Newsmakers, I'm Tim White. Joining us on the second half of the program will be Joe Fleming, but with us right now is Eyewitness News reporter Ted Nisi, as always, and Kevin Olasanoye, Leanne Senek. Thank you very much for joining us on the program. I'm sure we're all taking a deep breath after the primary <laughs> on Wednesday and hopefully catching up Indeed. on some sleep. You know, before we get into the governor's race, Kevin, I, uh, we're taping this on a Friday. Uh, the buzz right now is uh, the thing swirling around Speaker Mattiello. So I just I want to ask you about that briefly. The majority of the candidates Speaker uh, Nick Mattiello supported lost. His Republican challenger got more votes than he did in the primary. They were both, of course, un unopposed in that, uh, but in their respective races, Steve Frias got more votes there. And we're hearing his tenure as Speaker, even if he beats Steve Frias, is tenuous at best. Look, the Speaker controls the state Democratic Party. What do you make of it? You have a front row seat. So, so one thing I have to start with is the idea that the notion that the Speaker controls the Democratic Party comes from the structure of our state committee. There is a lot of separation between what the Speaker does and what the Democratic Party does. So I think that's the first and most important thing. But secondly, I would say, look, Speakers historically have supported candidates that are supporting their agenda, right? And the Speaker has been very clear about what his agenda is. It's a pro-jobs agenda. It's trying to um, reverse the car tax. It's you know, a lot of pro-business types of things, and I think he's entitled to support, you know, whoever he thinks is going to support that agenda. I think it's pretty clear that... It's kind of unusual, though, to have a lawmaker in the Providence Journal, a sitting lawmaker, say, yep, yeah, uh, the, the speaker does not have my support. I voted for him last time, not going to do it this time. Uh, do, do you think his power is weakening right now? I, I, You'd have to talk to, to the individual legislators to know that. I think, you know, obviously there's going to be a conversation in January about the speakership, and I think at that time, you know, people will make decisions. I know that today is September 14th or 15th, and we have eight weeks to go until the general election. And frankly, um, if we don't have a if if we don't have a Democratic majority, there's no conversation to be having. And so I think. Primaries Are you actually are, worried? <laughs> no, for the first time since the Great Depression. No, 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 no. I mean that to say that you know I think all of the legislators, legislators in the legislature, are going to have to make decisions about who they'd like to see as their leader, and that's a decision to be made in January. Right now, I think the party has got to be focused on trying to pick up seats in the General Assembly to the extent that we can do that. I feel confident that we're going to be able to do that, and and you know individual legislators will make their own decisions. Leanne. Uh, the same topic here, but would if Speaker Mattiello is unseated either uh, in the actual election or by his caucus um, if he gets through it, is that actually bad for Republicans? I remember having Joe Trillo when he was a Republican state lawmaker. I think it was on this show. He said, no, we actually like Speaker Mattiello because we're scared of the alternative. No, I think that, well, there's no doubt in my mind that the Speaker is weakened by the events on of the primary. I think that he's he is going into, the, into his race weakened and I of course have every confidence in Steve Frias that he will be successful in his campaign but I do think that it is a consideration because we know that even if all the Republicans that are running were to win their race we're still not going to have a majority in the General Assembly so the people who will be choosing the next speaker it's going to be uh, that schism that's in the Democrat Party with the far left progressives and the kind of old school Democrats so I, I think we align more closely with those old school Democrats the, the blue dog Democrats or the more conservative Democrats whatever you want to call them they would align more with the Republican values and we would like to see someone in that tradition continuing on as speaker rather than one of the more progressive people isn't it better than just have the speaker stay in place? Have Steve drop out? Uh, no, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> a loyalist, all right. Let's turn to the governor's race. Um, I'm gonna, Kevin, we'll, I'll start with you again. So uh, Governor Raimondo had a 
quite a good night. I th I'd say she beat just about all the... I didn't hear anyone suggesting she'd get a 20-plus point margin yeah. over Matt Brown. Um, they, they come out, people saying, wow, she's stronger than we thought. Hours later, they screw up their first television ad by having pictures of Providence uh, when they're trying to attack Alan Fung on Cranston. Doesn't that just reinforce Alan Fung's argument about the incompetence of, of Governor Raimondo, both on the official side and now on the campaign side? Well, I think two things, right? The first is... Let's remember that four years ago, Alan Fung filmed the TV commercial in Ohio, right? I mean, so this is a little bit worse than calling the pot, the pot calling the kettle black. Here's the truth. The truth is that the criticisms that are leveled in that uh, commercial are legitimate. And I think Alan Fung should have to answer for some of those. He certainly didn't answer them during the primary. Um, Cranston is a distressed city, has received aid as a distressed city. And Alan Fung is running around the state saying that he has better management skills than Gina Raimondo. I think that raises a legitimate issue. Um, and with respect to the schools portion of it, look, there's no community around our state that doesn't have school buildings that are in need of better construction. And Governor Raimondo is leading the charge on making sure that those school bundings, those school buildings get rebuilt. All right, you're, you're into the governor's stump speech, so I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna switch to Leanne. Leanne, you know, you hear, you hear their Mayor Funk did have a, a flap about an ad, so it is, a, you know, it isn't, it, maybe both sides need to have a neutrality act on this one. What do you say? No, I think that the, the difference is that he didn't claim that that was actually Rhode Island where he was, that he, they, you know, he got some flack because he filmed out of state rather than supporting an in-business state. That's what his flack was about. But this was actually calling, you know, Cranston into question and putting in Providence, which just shows how out of touch the governor seems to be with her own state. Um, and putting in the school building, not that is a, a regular practice, but that picture they had of the school building was as a result of the flooding that happened um, in Cranston. That's where that damage came from. But I think this is just another botched rollout by the governor. It's, it's, it's a tradition for her, apparently, because it's like everything that she's trying to roll out every single time, there is a question about it. There's a mistake with it, and it just shows some incompetence. And looking back at Iceland being portrayed as Rhode Island or the cooler, warmer debacle, all of those things, they all add up to people just not being able to have confidence in what the governor's putting out there. Kevin, 20 seconds, then we're going to go with Tim. Well, look, I think the real question here is, what is Alan Fund's record? I mean, we run around the state, we know what the governor stands for, we know what she's done with our economy, turning it around, we know what she's done with getting universal pre-K, all of those types of things. Alan Funk has basically sat in the sidelines since May, right? And I think it's time that we have a conversation about what his real record is and ask the voters to make a choice about who they think is best positioned to be able to lead. Leanne, in uh, her acceptance speech, Governor Raimondo made it very clear that going into the general election, she is going to tie Alan Fung and President Donald Trump together. Uh, I'm wondering if Donald Trump would be welcome to Rhode Island if he asked to come here to stump for Alan Fung. Um, certain there are some people that would welcome him to come here. It's not a decision that the campaign has made currently. I don't think it's something that they will. Alan is running on his own record. He is running on his service, and he's running on the differences between um, what he can do for Rhode Island and what the but governor has But the governor's going to try and change that narrative. She is is, the, is, the, president, that narrative. is the president a help or a hindrance <laughs> to, to Alan Fung? Oh, I guess it depends on what happens in the next few weeks. We've seen him as a help in some other states. In Rhode Island, I don't think it plays as well. Um, there is, you know, a huge democratic process here, and the the governor herself has been part of that resist movement. So I think that we need to look at: Do we want to resist what's going on? She's resisting the, the president, but she's also taking credit for the economic upturn as a result of federal policies. So th there's a big difference there, and we've just got to. This campaign is about the message, and it's about discipline, and it's about staying with that message and talking about what can be done for the state of Rhode Island, not what's going on at the federal level. Kevin. People are going to buy that. I mean, Alan Fung is not Donald Trump. And, you know, I know the, the governor likes to say uh, that she helped stop an oil rig from being built off the coast of Rhode Island. Did people, did people really think an oil rig was going to be built off the coast of Rhode Island? I mean, uh, are people going to buy into that? No, I think the uh, fundamentally midterm, national midterm elections are about what's happening in Washington, D.C. And what we know for sure is Alan Fung has, at every step of the way, said he would support the president's policies. I do want to push back on something I just heard, which sure. is this idea that Governor Raimondo is taking credit for policies that happen at the national level with the Bush, uh, I assume you mean by the Trump tax cuts. The mm -hmm. truth is Rhode Island's economy was on an upturn 
long before Donald Trump ever got to the White House, right? And that's a conversation that national Democrats are going to be having. That's a conversation we're going to be having here in Rhode Island. Just because the economy is doing better under President Trump doesn't necessarily mean that the building blocks were not in place for our economic recovery beforehand. I'll just say this really quickly. Mm. You cannot call yourself a Republican in this election cycle and not have to answer the questions about where and where you differ, where you differ from Donald Trump and where you don't. Right. So on the question of sanctuary cities or on the question of uh, immigration, we know where Alan Fung stands. He's in lockstep with Donald Trump. He should have to answer those questions. Absolutely. 20 seconds, Leanne. Lockstep with Donald Trump, Alan Fung? I don't believe he is in lockstep with Donald Trump on immigration. I think that when he came out on immigration, he was talking about detaining people who are criminals in the system who are also illegal aliens. There's a difference between that and what the president has suggested on immigration. So there's definitely some difference there. All right. There's a lot of difference on a lot of those things, and I do think that we do, we want to know where they stand, what is different from the Trump administration, and what would be different in a Fung administration, definitely different than a Raimondo administration. Well, lucky for, for us, both of your candidates will finally debate on our yeah. station, yes. uh, which I <laughs> say equally I can to the two parties. So. <laughs> um, uh, Leah, let me stick with you, actually. So, uh, you know, Alan Fung, uh, he's looked competitive in the polls so far. Uh, certainly, that's that's the buzz nationally, that he, ha he has a shot at, at, at this this fall. Looking past that, though, on the down ballot races, um, the Republicans declined to field a candidate for attorney general against Democrat Peter Narona, even though he's not even an incumbent. Um, your lieutenant governor candidate at last check did not have much money. I don't believe your secretary of state candidate did either. I know your treasurer candidate, uh, Michael Riley, does have personal resources I, that he may put in. Um, is it going to be, do you have any hope that you can win those down ballot races, or are all your hopes pinned on Alan Fung becoming governor at, for, a, for a big win for the Republicans that night? I think our best hopes are with the governorship. I think we also have a very good um, sen senatorial candidate that's running, Robert Flanders. Um, so those will be the people that would draw people in. I think once they look at the differences in those two candidates, they will vote down ballot for the other candidates. Um, Mike Riley has a really good case to make against um, the current treasurer and what he can do as treasurer. So I think that would be a good race. And I think it's going to be up to people to, you know, listen to that message and see the differences between what the two parties have to offer. And there are very definite differences in this campaign. Kevin, sometimes it feels like covering two parties just when I cover the Democrats. <laughs> you yeah. know how it can be over in your neck of the woods. Are you, you had that hard-fought LG race, Aaron Regenberg sure. trying to bring the progressives together, Dan McKee with more of the moderate establishment, uh, Matt Brown's challenge to the governor. You had legislative races where, which were real progressive uh, incumbent fights. Are you concerned about bringing the Democratic Party back together in this tight window before November 6th? Absolutely not. Here's the thing that I've always said about the Democratic Party. And you've heard the chairman say this repeatedly as well. There are two wings on this plane, and you, you know we're a big tent party. We've got to be able, as our party, to be the party of diversity and have a cross section of people who disagree with one another. But the stakes in this election, I think everybody understands, whether it's health care, education, all the issues that either progressives or moderates care about. There is only one candidate at the top of our ticket who is going to lead the charge on those values. That's Gina Raimondo. And so I think, you know, the way that some of the primaries were conducted gives me a lot of hope that, you know, for the most part, there weren't really that many nasty attacks. Um, obviously, in the fits and spurts there, there were. But I think this party is going to be able to come back together very quickly. And we have to. We have no choice because the progress that we have made in this state is on the ballot in November. And I think all Democrats, whether they're on the progressive side, of the aisle, in the middle, or traditional, whatever you want to call them, I think they all understand that. Do you expect, Leanne, uh, Patricia Morgan, and Matt Brown did endorse Gina Raimondo uh, during our live primary special on uh, Wednesday night. Patricia Morgan said she wasn't ready yet, and I don't believe she has as of this taping, which is Friday morning. Do you expect Patricia Morgan to endorse Alan Fung? I'm not sure what she will do. I know she has put out a statement saying, you know, thanking all of her supporters. I think that, um, you know, it, these races are so hard fought, it's difficult to just immediately make that turnaround. So I think that, you know, it, she will come around, I'm sure. Um, but I think, you know, she needs a little bit of time to do that and to think about the best way that she wants to do that to bring her supporters in. I hope that she does that for the sake of the party. It is the right thing to do for the Republican Party. Um, but that delay, you know, just always makes people kind of question that. But we had the same thing in the last um, primary, Ken Block. It took him a few days to come out to endorse the, the primary winner who was Alan Fung at the time also. So we will see what happens. But I think the, the biggest thing that we have to look forward to going forward, we do have to unite our party because the thing that will hurt us more 
um, will be the third party candidate. Joe Leanne, Trillo. Uh, yes. Uh, Leanne, we, we have to go to a break in you know less than a minute. So I just real brief, I'm, I'm truly curious about this. The, the National Republican Party is going to uh, be very focused on trying to keep both chambers of Congress. Um, do you see the national, you're the national, uh, you know, party committee woman for Rhode Island. Do you see the national GOP coming in to help Robert Flanders in the Senate race? I think there will be some help um, for the state party that will be translate to assistance in that Senate race, but um, they are actually focused also on the governor's race, which is a huge difference for us because our party is not as well financed as the the state party for the, on the other side. So I think that we will see some resources coming in from national, which is going to be a game changer for us. We were able to hire an executive director. We are bringing on field staff for the Republican Party, which is something we haven't had um, in recent years, and that will be a big difference, and that will be in part um, with some assistance from the National Party. Kevin Olasanoye, Leanne Senek, thank you very much for joining us on the program. I'm sure we'll have you back pretty soon. When we come back, <laughs> we're going to break down primary night with Eyewitness News political analyst Joe Fleming. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Of course, joining me from Eyewitness News as well as Ted Nisi, and we welcome Eyewitness News political analyst Joe Fleming. We're Joe, gonna... I have spent more time with you than my <laughs> wife this week. <laughs> Same with me, yeah, Ted. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been a long week. Yes, it and has. Wednesday was a was a very long very long night. Look, um, I'll admit, I I was expecting a lower turnout uh, yep. on primary night than we actually saw. I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, we saw 117,000 people turn out for the Democrats and mm -hmm. 33,000 right. uh, turn out uh, for the Republicans. Um, not quite as high as 2014, nope. but but fairly close. For the Democrats. Right. For the Democrats right. so, and overall, I think it was like 150,000 or so. Right. 160,000 in 2014. Okay, there you go. So, but w it was it was pretty close. Joe, what do you th what do you make of the relatively high turnout? Well, I was surprised at the Democratic side because I thought it would be a little bit lower because it was kind of a quiet race. But I think you get the people who really who are Democrats who don't like Donald Trump. And they were coming out to vote. They wanted their opinion heard. Even though Donald Trump was not on the ballot, they wanted to get out there and have a say in this. Plus, I really think the governor's campaign did a really good grassroots job. They had the resources. They identified their voters, and they got them out on primary day. So that helped the Democrats. On the Republican side, I was very surprised the turnout went up. I really thought it would go down by about 5,000 votes. But, like, look at the city of Cranston. More people voted in the city of Cranston this time on the Republican side. And Alan Fung's numbers went from 75% to 82%. So obviously Alan Fung did his homework and really pushed the vote out in the areas he felt he was going to do better, and he got more votes this time than two than four years ago. Ted, I'll give you credit. Uh, uh, well, you, you, yeah. you were you were calling for a higher turnout than I think I was expecting. Yeah, well, and it was so it, write that down. It, we'll yeah, celebrate exactly. it next gonna, year. We're you keep, were right. We're going to keep that clip, folks. <laughs> um, I, it was mostly to me the only reason I stayed a little more bullish on turnout this year was because we've seen I felt like over and over nationally I was watching my fellow reporters in other states be surprised on their primary nights because they said, "Wow, we didn't." think it was that exciting and yet we're having a big turnout and I think Joe is correct that political passions are just very very mm -hmm. high in this country and he, and I do think a lot of it's driven by the president as well as reaction to the president and even though he's not on the ballot this year and even in Rhode Island relatively few of our races were even close to involving President Trump I think that's part of what's driving people to, to want to vote but it was still less than 2014 it was so it was bigger but the 2016 presidential primary had a much bigger turnout than that even mm -hmm. with Clinton on the ballot and Trump on the ballot. But I do think, I do think too, Joe makes a good point on the Democratic side, which is, you know, the governor's campaign, they have spent a ton of money on TV ads, and we've talked about that a lot. They talked before the election about we're investing right. in our ground game, we're identifying yes. our voters. They felt confident they had, you know, I think something like 90,000 voters they knew they knew were going to vote mm -hmm. for Tina Mundo as long as they got them to the polls. But campaigns always say they have a good right. ground game. It's only that night you see if it actually worked, and it does seem it worked for but them. But that's the big advantage you have when you have all the resources. Right. Gina Raimondo has the money to do exactly that, get the right people in there, use the phone banks, identify the voters. If you don't have the money, which Matt Brown was lacking, that really hurts your ground game because you don't have a strong ground but game. But you can only you can only bring people out if they're supporting you. And right. I do think, you know, uh, I think we we talked about in the last segment that uh, the nobody I talked to, even the governor's advisors, expected her to pull a twenty plus 
point margin lead over Matt. So what does that say going into uh, going into the general assembly? Uh, excuse me, the general election for for Governor Raimondo. I'm going to ask you an Alan Fung question okay. uh, uh, about that. But what does that say for her strength? Going well, I think she she certainly looks like a stronger candidate now than she did a week ago. I think uh, you know, and there's a reason people have said that she only got 42 percent in the primary last time, 41 percent or so for governor to win that election. Her approval ratings have been middling around one way or the other on the 40 percent. Is this mark. the first time she's been above 50% yes. as a governor? Yes, I should as a say, governor. Other than treasurer. her treasury, right. she's never been. A, so I think showing that, it also means we talk a lot about splits in the Democratic Party, the governor's issues after pension reform, as well as being a more, sort of a more moderate, business-minded Democrat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Clearly, there's still a plenty of Democrats who see her as a solid Democrat they're going to vote for. And not to mention, you have to think at least some, I had people tweeting at me yesterday how mad they were at the governor for her nasty campaign against Matt Brown, and then saying, and I'm going to vote for her because I'm so mad at the Republicans this year. So she may help bring, Donald Trump may help Gina Raimondo bring the Democratic Party back together. I asked this of Leanne Sinek. I will yeah. ask you, would Alan Fung uh, welcome Donald Trump here to stump? I don't think Alan Fung would. I think the Democratic Party would welcome <laughs> Donald Trump to Rhode Island because if Donald Trump came to Rhode Island, that's going to increase Democratic trend on the province, Pawtucket, Central Falls, Woonsocket, where there's heavily Democrats who really don't like Donald Trump. I don't think Donald Trump could add anything for Alan Fung at this point in the campaign. Um, I think he could hurt him more than help him. Yeah, but obviously he's going to have to respond to it because the right. governor's going to make The governor's going to tie him to Donald Trump as much as possible. He's going to, she's going to ask Alan Fung, what policies don't you agree with? Tell us what you don't agree with with that. The problem Alan Fung has, if he disagrees with Donald Trump too much, the voters have a place to go. They can go to Joe Trillo. So he can't distance himself too much from D Donald Trump because they, they, those, those voters c might get upset with him and go to Joe Trillo. And I think you heard right there with Leanne and Kevin, you know, what I think is going to be the tug of war of this general election, which is Alan Fung trying to keep the focus on Governor right. Raimondo's first term, the missteps he, he would cite, such as UHIP and uh, Cooler and Warmer and, and his disagreement with her on economic policy. Gina Raimondo, first of all, making a positive case for a record, saying, no, my record's not as bad as you say. And by the way, don't forget all these other things you don't like about Republicans nationally I'm against that stuff and Alan Fung is going to be an ally for the National Republicans that's going to be something they fight on TV they fight in the debates and voters are going to have to decide what's important to them when they go to the polls. We're already seeing the campaign turn negative 12 hours after the primary there's negative ads on from both campaigns I think we're going to see a very negative campaign I think we're going to see also a lot of independent expenditures coming in Rhode Island uh, and really, those are going to be mostly negative ads, not positive ads. I asked Kevin Olasanoi this question or a version of it, so I'm going to ask you this uh, taping on a Friday. Um, and the buzz right now, boy, is about uh, Speaker Mattiello. Uh, I'm sure your phone is blown up about <laughs> it. Uh, his authority is being publicly questioned by sitting members of the General Assembly. D do you think he's feeling restless this morning? I would imagine, knowing <laughs> Speaker Mattiello <laughs> and his occasional temper, he was not a happy camper on Thursday morning, uh, especially a race like Maura Walsh. I mean, uh, we, the last time Kevin was on, we were talking about that uh, endorsement debacle where the party endorsed yeah, her right. uh, and then took the end, uh, endorsed her opponent. The speaker took it, uh, they took it back. The speaker stayed with her. His people were hard trying to defeat more Welsh, and they couldn't. Others that the speaker's team also wanted out of the, general, out of the House lost uh, to, uh, or excuse me, won that night. I'm messing up my who was with who. <laughs> Long story short, I think the speaker's authority has weakened right now. I think you wouldn't see Mary Duffy Messier a sitting uh, member, not a bomb-throwing member of the House, talking to Catherine Gregg of the Journal this morning about right. uh, not voting for Speaker Mattiello. You wouldn't see names being floated ever more aggressively about right. who his replacements would be. And I think that's both about questions about his authority in the Democratic Party right now, in the Democratic caucus, and also real uh, wondering among people about whether he'll hang on against Steve Frias in November. All right, so we have a little under two minutes left. Joe, I want to look at the national yep. races here. We uh, can't forget we have uh, a U.S. Senate race here, yep. uh, Republican Robert Flanders and the Democratic incumbent Sheldon Whitehouse. Um, as I asked Leanne Senek, you know, the, the GOP nationally will right. probably have their hands full just trying to hold on to mm -hmm. both chambers there. Do, do you see them parachuting into Rhode Island? At this time, no. I think if Bob Flanders can get out there, spend some money now, and get name recognition up and start to build an image of himself and have some polling that shows the gap's closing, they might put money in the state. But if they see a wide gap, they're not going to throw money in because they have other seats that are very competitive. They're trying to hold on to the, hold on to the Senate. 
So and let, if this is a long shot, no, the money won't come in. If Bob Flanders can get out there early and spend money early, it might generate more money to make the race competitive. But if it doesn't do that, I don't see any money coming in for him. And you know, that's one of the toughest things about politics. You need to have enough money right. to get competitive often, uh, to get more money to come in to stay competitive. Right. And and I've heard from many uh, candidates on the wrong side of that equation saying, well, how but it doesn't take a lot of money in this market. I'm l less than a minute left, right? I mean, if you're if you're looking for a bang for your buck, Rhode Island's pretty good. Right. Yeah, but you know, it's it still feels like a lot of money when you're making the calls to raise five hundred thousand dollars and you've never done it before. Someone mm -hmm. like Bob Flanders is. So I just think I think that is is going to be a challenge for him. And they're also afraid to spend all the money up front and have nothing later on. Mm -hmm. But if you don't spend it up front, even if you have it later on, you're not going to move the voters. All right, yeah. Joe Fleming, Ted Nisi, thank you very much. And remember, we are your place for the election. Eyewitness News has the polling. Eyewitness News has the best debate. So make sure you stay with us on WPRI.com and on Eyewitness News for Ted Nisi and Joe Fleming. Thank you for watching. I'm Tim White. We will see you next week on Newsmakers.